Welcome back to this session. In this session, we will be discussing about bag and mask ventilation. I would request Dr. Saluja to talk about bag and mask ventilation. I, ho I hope you have uh, re remembered and uh, you have learned the initial part of neonatal resuscitation, which is initial steps, which we uh, were to perform in first 30 seconds. And uh, the second part of our resuscitation is the B component, which is the breathing, uh, which would, should also be co covered or should be performed on the newborn baby for next 30 seconds to have a response. Before I go on to the uh, bag and mask ventilation, let me quickly revise that which are the babies who require bag and mask ventilation. What is bag and mask ventilation is that we have a bag which gives a positive pressure and we have a mask which is able to deliver the breath to the baby. That is the purpose of doing it. Dr. Saluja, before you go on to the bag and mask, can you tell them what are the different types of bags and what are the different types of masks? Which are that, that will come to when I talk about the okay. bags. Huh? Okay. And uh, that is why this is also called positive pressure ventilation because with the help of any type of bag we have, we give a positive pressure and it gives a breath to the baby. Now if I was to quickly recapitulate that what were the indications or which were the babies who require positive pressure ventilation, we said there are three indications. Number one, if after 30 seconds of initial steps, baby is not breathing. Also remember that a baby who is apneic or who is not breathing is same as gasping respiration. So that is the first indication. It is never that you will start bag and mask ventilation at birth. You will always perform initial steps and if after 30 seconds of initial steps, baby is still not breathing, that baby qualifies for positive pressure ventilation with the help of a bag and mask. The second indication is that if after 30 seconds of initial steps, baby is breathing, breathing well, but the heart rate is still less than 100. So that becomes the second indication. And if after 30 seconds of initial steps, baby is breathing, baby has a heart rate of more than 100, but has central cyanosis, and even when you have given free flow oxygen for 30 seconds, baby still has central cyanosis. So that is the third indication. Now, for effective positive pressure ventilation, we need some equipment. And the most important equipment is the bag. There are two types of bags available. And there are certain other devices available to give positive pressure ventilation. But this is a bag which is called self-inflating bag. Why do we call it self-inflating? You press and it inflates on its own. You press and it inflates. So this is called self-inflating bag. There is another type of bag which is called flow-inflating bag which is not commonly used and that is why we don't talk about it much. But our anesthesia colleagues use them in operation theatres. So we will not touch about flow inflating bags. Then there are certain other devices like TPs, TPs resuscitators, which also we are not going to discuss in today's session. What essentially we are going to talk about is this piece of equipment which is called self inflating bag. First of all, the size of the bag. There are different size of the bags available. A small size whose capacity is about 240 milliliters and this is a bigger bag whose capacity is 500 ml. There is even bigger bag available which is 750 ml. For newborn babies resuscitation, <coughs> anywhere between 240 to 750 ml capacity bag is good enough. But for large majority of babies, this bag should do which is a capacity of 500 milliliters. This main portion of the bag is the body of the bag which gives the positive pressure. It has a back end, it has a front end. And we as resuscitators should know all the body parts and their uses. And you as nurses should know how to dis disassemble this and reassemble this so as you can clean this 
part as well. So I will talk about the parts of this bag. This is the body of the bag which is required to give a breadth. At the back portion you have two holes. Can you see these two holes? This is the bigger one and this is the smaller one. These are inlets of the bags. So inlets which get something into the body of the bag. You have a small inlet, you have a bigger inlet. This small inlet is called the oxygen inlet. This small one is the oxygen inlet where you collect a tubing and this tubing is connected to a oxygen source. So this goes to oxygen source and this provides oxygen to this bag. If this is not connected, then we are providing a positive pressure breath at room air. Dr. Saluja, yeah. <coughs> why do we need this kind of a bag at all? Why can't we connect the tubing directly with the mask and let the baby get the oxygen? Yeah, if a baby, as I said in my first part of the talk, that if you attach the oxygen tubing to the mask and give it to the baby, you are giving free flow oxygen. You are not giving a positive pressure breath to that baby. So if a baby is apneic and is not breathing, there is no point giving that baby free flow oxygen. What you need is a device which will give a breath to the baby. So that is why you need a device which gives a positive pressure when you press this. Because if you attach the mask and the oxygen tubing, there is oxygen flowing. The baby has to take a breath to get the oxygen in. So that is important. So this is, that means we are forcing the oxygen into the lungs. Yeah. Through the positive yeah, pressure. Yeah, that is what is, is it is what doing. It it gives a positive pressure, pressure breath, and that is why this is called positive pressure ventilation. If you don't connect anything here, then if you give a breath, it gives the baby room air. If you connect oxygen source to the oxygen inlet, you give something like 40 percent oxygen to the baby when you give a positive breath. Now let us see. What is this big inlet here? This is another inlet which is called the air inlet. When you deflate this, it self inflates by getting air from this inlet. If you were to block this tightly, it, it is difficult to inflate. Can you see? I don't know whether you can appreciate. If you tightly block this, it doesn't inflate very well. But if you release this, it inflates very well. That means when it has to expand, it gets air from this bigger inlet. That is why this is called air inlet and this is the oxygen inlet. Another advantage of having this ox air inlet is that if you were to connect a device which is called a reservoir, this bag is called a reservoir, you could have this bag or you could have a corrugated tube attached to this and if oxygen was now attached to this, it serves the purpose of giving this baby 90 to 100 percent oxygen. So what are these? These are two types of reservoirs, the bag reservoir and a corrugated tube reservoir whose function is to increase the concentration of oxygen during resuscitation to almost 100 percent. But if you don't attach this, it gives 40 percent. If you don't attach this, then you give room air which is approximately 21 percent. So you could give a positive pressure ventilation at 21 percent oxygen, at 40 percent oxygen and at 100 percent oxygen. When you connect the oxygen source here, this reservoir fills with oxygen and when you give a breath and when it reinflates, instead of air entering into the bag, oxygen enters and that is why you give 100 percent oxygen. Is that clear? So body of the bag, at the back end we have the oxygen inlet and the air inlet. Now we come to the middle portion of the bag. There is an attachment here, can you appreciate this? This is a safety valve, like you have safety valve in the pressure cooker, there is a safety valve in the device as well. So that 
accidentally you don't give very high pressure to the baby. If you give very high pressure to the baby, the lungs can rupture. Whenever you press it very hard and the pressure generated is more than 40 centimeters of water, the extra pressure is leaked from this valve. That is why this is called a pop-off valve or safety valve which is set at 40 centimeters of water. So if I press very hard, Yes, please, yeah, Jammu, have, please yeah. speak up. Yes, please. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, we are from Jammu. We have three students here. Okay. Thoda kam kar they would like to interact. In fact, they are, uh, uh, their, their complaint is that they have been able to listen to this, but some visuals they have not been able to see. If those visuals can be repeated. Uh, can, can we can have the visuals which they want? Hello. To can, yeah. can we have the... Uh, can can they tell us what what are the visuals they have not seen? Uh -huh. just, just hold on. Just, they will they will speak. Yes, please. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes, uh, please. Ma Madam, I am Indra Indra Moza. Okay. Ha. Uh, just what? we are watching this uh, tel your telecast. Okay. So thank you for this, but there is not visual any visual we cannot see. Demonstration is not there. No, but they don't have the you, you don't have Hello? The, it's not working there. Hello? Hello? Is it not working there? Uh, we cannot, we can hear you, but we cannot see the demonstration. I think there must be some fault there at the regional center, Jammu. Hello, ma'am? Yes. What is the problem? Are you getting the video there? Hello? Hello? Hello, are you getting the video there? No, we are not getting yet. They are not getting the video. So they, they must have problem over there, some problem. Will there is some problem in your uh, this uh, visual. So you better listen. No, but... Uh, <laughs> If we can't see what we are trying to demonstrate, probably uh, listening will not make that much of... But what we can do is... These, these you are can, the technical... Yeah, uh, you can uh, either uh, listen to this, uh, uh, what we are trying to explain or record this uh, uh, audio and then we can mail you a CD after some time and then you can uh, yes. again have a demonstration at your regional center because we are having the video quite clearly here. Shall I proceed? Okay, yes, so please proceed on. Okay. Please bear with us with this fault. But if you Any want to ask some questions, you are free to ask questions right now. Indrani? Hello? Hello. No. If you have any questions, please. Jammu, if you have any questions, please send the question. Dr. Saluja, please continue. Then we continue. So this we talked about the safety valve or the pop-up valve of the device. Just try to listen. If I do it gently, I don't get any extra noise. But if I press very firmly, you can hear this sound. And if I were to press this safety valve, that sound again disappears. That means whenever I am generating a pressure of more than 40 centimeters of water, the extra is getting leaked from the pop-up valve or the safety valve. So this is a safety of this bag so that accidentally you are not giving very high pressures to the newborn baby and you do not rupture the lungs or create pneumothorax on this baby. Then these are the outlet and has certain valve assembly into this. When I press, there is a gush of air which comes out from here and the air gets into the baby's lungs. It has an inspiratory valve and an expiratory valve here which I don't think I'll be able to demonstrate to you on this media, but just there is a, f can you see something opening when I press? I can see on the television screen, I'm sure you can also see. So this is the inspiratory valve. When I press this, you can see something opening up. Just concentrate here. Can I have the closer please? Yeah, can you see something opening up in the, in the center of this? Uh, yeah, like the, yeah, it's quite clear now. 
this, this whatever is opening is the inspiratory valve. So now when I give a breath, this valve opens and the breath goes into the baby. And then, can I have a further close up? On this panel where you see this blue sheet, there are tiny holes which act as an expiratory valve and the baby when breathes out, it ex exhales from this area. So that means when the baby exhales, it doesn't get back into the bag. So when I give a positive breath, the air comes out and then when the baby breathes in, it escapes from here and doesn't go back into the body of the bag. So there is no mixing of gases when the baby is breathing out. Is that clear? When I give a breath, this opens and the air goes into the baby. When the baby breathes out, it breathes out and goes out from here and does not get into the body of the bag. It's like a valve mechanism? Yeah, valve. that is an exhalation valve and this is the inspiratory valve. Okay. Then we come to the second part of the resuscitation device which is... But we must feel sorry but for the video problem there if they are not able to see, see it. Monster. Then another important part is the mask which has to fit on the baby's mouth to deliver a baby breath. There are different types of ma masks. Uh, I'll explain, I'll demonstrate there. Uh, can I have the close-up please? Now there are two shapes. You can see this, this is the triangular shape which is called the anatomical mask, anatomical shape mask and this is a rounded shape which is a rounded mask. These anatomical sh marks are usually sharper. It, they cause more trauma. The peak comes over the nose and the rest goes over the chin. But these are not commonly used, so we will not discuss this. The common ones are round masks and their edges are cushioned so that they don't traumatize the baby's face, right? So this is a mask which come in different sizes. This is a smaller size, this is a bigger size. Now what is an appropriate size of the mask? Appropriately sized mask is the one which covers the chin of the baby, the mouth and the nose, but not the eyes. That means chin, mouth and the nose and not the eyes. When we demonstrate it on the baby, it should cover the chin, the mouth and the nose. It should not cover the eyes. If I was to do it like this, it should cover the chin, the mouth and the nose. Now, this is covering the nose, but if it was so big that it co covers the eyes as well, that is wrong. Only the mouth, the, the chin, the mouth and the nose the chin, mouth and the nose and this is how this bag is placed and this is not covering the eyes at all. So this is a mask which is an appropriate size mask for this baby. Let me see this mask. This is a mask which I keep over the chin, it covers only the mouth, doesn't cover the nose. So this is small for this baby. This may be alright for a premature tiny baby but if a mask also covers the eyes that is also a wrong size mask. Now let us learn how this mask gets fitted into the bag. Yeah, can I have it here? No. Now this is the mask. You check and place it over the outlet of the mask, of the bag. This is the outlet and I put it like this. And now I am ready. Now how do I check that this bag and mask is working effectively? You take this bag along with the mask and place it over your palm like this and when I press I can feel the pressure over my palm and then if I press hard I should be able to hear the pop of noise as well that means whatever extra pressure is being generated if there is a leak I am not able to press it very hard against my palm then also I don't hear any sound and I don't feel any pressure over my palm but if I make a tight seal, then I give a positive pressure bed to this baby. So I have to have an equipment which is working well. I have to have a mask which is properly fitting and there should not be any leakage in this mask. Then I place this over the baby's chin, mouth and nose and then I start giving a breath to baby. Can I have a close-up of the chest? Huh. Is, is, is area 
यहाँ पे फोकस करना है वेन आई प्लेस इट वेल कैन यू सी द चेस्ट मूविंग एवरी टाइम आई गिव ए ब्रेथ द चेस्ट एक्सपैंड आई एम श्योर यू कैन एप्रिशिएट दिस एवरी टाइम आई गिव ए ब्रेथ देर इज ए चेस्ट मूवमेंट डॉक्टर पीटी कैन यू एप्रिशिएट यस now the positive sign is rise and fall of yeah. the chest now what is the efficacy of this positive pressure ventilation with every breath there should be a visible rise of the chest chest leakage Yeah. Yes. Every time I give a bear, and these fingers should be kept loose here. So you cup your mask with your thumb and the index finger like this. Place it over here. Stabilize. Make a tight seal, and give a breath. If your seal is loose, you will not induce a positive breath. So the efficacy of the bag is that you see a visible rise. It should not be a very maximal rise. Not like this. it should not fully rise it should be just a visible rise so that means baby is breathing quietly and not a very heavy breath you should not attempt to have a maximal rise like this attempt a gentle visible rise of the chest like this right so that means now it is effective how how often to give it how fast we should give or how many breaths in a minute we should give we all know that the newborn babies breathe at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute and we should aim at giving 40 to 60 positive pressure breaths in a minute's time and how do we achieve that what we do is we place it properly and then we count in this rhythm breathe breathe means i squeeze and then i say 1 2 breathe 1 2 breathe 1 2 breathe 1 2 breathe so whenever i say breathe i give a squeeze on the back and then i wait i count 1 and 2 i wait and then when i say breathe again then i give another breath for example breathe 1 2 breathe 1 2 breathe 1 2 breathe 1 2 so you have to practice this rhythm in such a way that you are able to deliver 40 to 60 breaths per minute now if i am not able to achieve a good chest rise what could be the problems problems could be the neck is not in a proper position which we have talked about that that should be in slightly extended neck there is improper seal that i have not been able to seal it well and that is why i can't push in breath into the baby there are some secretions in the mouth because of which the air cannot get into the lungs So, if there are secretions, I need need to do suction of those secretions, or I am not applying enough pressure. Unless I apply enough pressure, the breathing is not going to be there. So, for example, if I apply very light pressure, the chest expansion will not be there. So, improper seal, presence of secretions in the mouth, or inadequate pressure are causes for failure of positive pressure ventilation. Now, if I am able to do successful positive pressure ventilation, what do I do? I do this for 30 seconds, and then reassess the baby. What are the signs of improvement when I do positive pressure ventilation? Signs of improvement are the heart rate should rise; it should go above 100, and the cyanosis should disappear. That means the color should improve. But after 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation, I do the evaluation in the same sequence. breathing heart rate and color if the breathing is now coming up baby is breathing spontaneously heart rate is more than 100 the color has become pink then i can stop positive pressure ventilation but if the breathing child child is breathing heart rate is less than 100 i continue positive pressure ventilation for another 30 seconds and do another assessment after 30 seconds so till the time child breathing is well heart rate is more than 100 and child has become pink i continue positive pressure ventilation is that all
I think we must go to chest compressions also. Okay. Yeah. Now, <coughs> let us take a scenario that I performed initial steps for 30 seconds. Baby was not breathing. I started positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds. Baby still doesn't show improvement. So when I say baby is not improving, what does it mean? It means baby may not be breathing or the heart rate is not normal. We have learned one heart rate to begin with. One heart rate was a rate of 100. That means heart rate of less than 100 means that baby requires positive pressure ventilation after 30 seconds of initial steps. But if after providing bag and mask ventilation for 30 seconds, if the heart rate is less than 60 now, remember these two heart rates are to be remembered for resuscitation, a heart rate of 100 and a heart rate of 60. 60 is the cutoff for deciding about next step for resuscitation which is chest compressions. What are chest compressions? We all know that our heart pumps, pumps in such a way that we are able to maintain a good circulation to our body organs. But asphyxiated newborns who are not able to breathe, who have slower heart rates, are not able to pump the blood effectively. So if the baby's heart is not able to pump effectively, what do we do? We help the baby pump baby's heart pump more effectively. So this is the third component of resuscitation. When we said TABC, we covered T, we covered B and now is C. That means if the baby's circulation is not good because of ineffective pumping of the heart, we have to support the circulation of the baby. And how do we improve the effectivity of pumping of heart? We compress the baby's heart between the sternum and the spine to induce a cardiac contraction. We all know the heart of the baby lies beneath the sternum and between the spine. This is the spine and this is the sternum. So heart lies in between them. If we were to induce a compression like this, that means we are contracting the heart to allow the heart to pump the blood and maintain circulation adequately. So that means we are addressing C part of resuscitation. Now we learn how to do chest compressions. <coughs> so let us first of all say what are the indications of giving chest compressions. Now we say that after one minute of resuscitation, that means 30 seconds of initial steps and 30 seconds of bag and mask, if the baby's heart rate is less than 60, we will provide chest compressions. And how do we know it is less than 60? We learn that heart rate has to be counted for 6 seconds. That means in 6 seconds, if we count less than 6, it is 3, 4 or 5, the heart rate is less than 60 and we have to perform chest compressions. Now when we talk in terms of chest compressions, first of all, where to give it, what is the technique and how to give it and how often to give it. First of all, let's learn where to give chest compressions. What, chest, are the landmarks of what are the landmarks? The chest compressions have to be given in a line. If you can imagine that these are two nipples of the baby, the breast nipples. If we join these two and draw a horizontal line, then you have to perform chest compressions over the sternum, which is below this imaginary line. This is the central part is the sternum. This is the ziphoid. The, if you have an ordinary imaginary line joining two nipples, then the body of the sternum which is beneath this line is the area where we are going to perform the chest compressions, like this area. How to quickly localize this? If you go along the rib cage of the baby, these are the rib, ribs and this is the rib cage. You go along the rib cage, lower margin of the rib cage, you reach ziphoid. Just above the ziphoid is the area where you give chest compressions. So go along the rib cage, localize the ziphoid above the ziphoid. Never do chest compressions over the ziphoid. You will cause dislocation of fractures of ziphoid and it can ulcerate an underlying liver there. So just above the ziphoid is the place where you have to give 
chest compressions. What are the techniques? You could have two techniques. You could use two thumb technique or you could use two finger technique. Most often when the resuscitation is being performed, the baby lies like this. And imagine or remember that during resuscitation when chest compressions are required, somebody continues to provide positive pressure ventilation. Chest compressions are never given without positive pressure ventilation. So you need two persons when chest compressions have to be given. One person provides positive pressure ventilation, the other person is needed to provide chest compressions. It is not that you will give chest compressions and you will give bag and mask. So it has to be a coordination between a person who continues positive pressure ventilation and another person who provides chest compressions. Let's talk about thumb technique. When you have to provide chest compression with a thumb technique, you make your hand like this around the abdomen and chest of the baby. I'll just try to elevate this. Just hold the baby. I'm sorry I'm holding the baby like this, but just for demonstration purposes I'm doing this. Place your thumbs adjacent to each other or over each other. You can place these thumbs over each other. And this is a ziphoid. I'm placing my thumb like this and then try to give chest compressions like this. Another important thing is that pressure should be given with the tip of the thumbs and not with the whole thumb like this. If you do with the thumb, then you are pressing on the ribs and you can cause fracture of the ribs. So the compression has to be with tips of the thumb and not with the thumb as a whole. So you localize place your thumbs like this and then you give chest compressions this way. Very often when chest compressions are being given this way, you are obstructing the umbilicus and sometimes during resuscitation you may need umbilical excess for umbilical venous catheterization or giving medications later on. Another technique of giving chest compressions is two finger technique. You could use an index finger and a middle finger or a middle finger and a ring finger. These two fingers are kept at the same site and then you give vertical pressure like this or if your two fingers are equal like this then you could do it like this. Never give chest compression by keeping fingers slanting like this. They have to be vertical like this way. Those people who have big nails, chest compression cannot be done like this. What should be the depth of the compression? Yeah, I am coming to that. Huh? Okay. So these are the two techniques. By doing this you allow a person to have a free access to umbilicus and tends to be more tiring when you are doing a two finger technique. Thumb technique is better that way. But if a baby is very big and your hands are small, you may not be able to encircle the torso with your hands and then maybe two finger technique is better. Next comes the question that how deep to press? How deep it should go inside? If you were to imagine this is the thickness of abdominal, this is the whole depth of the thorax it should get down to approximately one third of the anterior posterior diameter. Say if the total depth of the chest is approximately this, the depth compression has to be one third of this. So, because different size babies will have different AP diameter, it should come to one third and then go back, one third and then go back, one third and then go back. This is how it should be done. One third compression and back, one third compression and then back, one third compression and then and back. Is it clear? Then of course we have learnt the site, we have learnt the technique, we have learnt how much to press and then we have to learn how frequently to press. We learned that when we give positive pressure ventilation, we give at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute, but then the baby's heart is beating well. But when we coordinate positive pressure ventilation and chest compressions, it has to be given at a rate of 3 to 1. That means three chest compressions and one positive pressure breath. So it makes a total of 120 events per minute. That means in one minute we will do the whole exercise 120 times. 90 chest compressions, 30 breaths. Instead of 40 to 60 breaths when we were giving bag and mass ventilation, we will only provide 30 breaths but then we will also provide 90 chest compressions in 
one minute. So total of 120 events. So how do we do that? The person who is doing chest compression has to count up bag and mask. Another person, so the person who is giving chest compressions counts and count in such a way when I say one I press I have to say and I re release one and two and three and breathe so three chest compressions one breath that is how you coordinate ratio should be three is to one one and two and three and one and two and three and breathe three. the person who is doing chest compressions will speak one and two and three and breathe one and two and three and breathe and and when I say breathe she gives a compression and when I say and that means it is released reinflating so one and two and three and breathe when I say breathe then only press one and two and three and breathe and so this is how cyclically you do at a ratio of three to one and you are able to give 90 chest compressions and 30 positive pressure ventilations. After we have done this for 30 seconds, we reevaluate. We reevaluate the baby's heart, heart rate. If now the heart rate is still less than 60, then we continue this exercise for another 30 seconds and then go on to medications. But if now the heart rate has come above 60, then we stop chest compressions and continue bag and mask ventilation for another 30 seconds, 60 seconds, depending on how often it is, for how long it is required. So uh, after the chest compressions, suppose the baby does not revive, <coughs> what is the another step? If after 30 seconds of chest compressions and positive pressure ventilation, baby's heart rate is still less than 60, we we'll continue this and then prepare for administering epinephrine to this baby and proceed on like that. What are the different types of drugs which are used? You see, resuscitation, uh, when we talk of neonatal resuscitation, we talk of very few drugs. I think only drug I want to talk today about is epinephrine or adrenaline. We all know that adrenaline comes in a dose in a strength of 1 in 1000. We have to dilute that adrenaline or epinephrine as 1 in 10,000. That means we take 1 ml of epinephrine and 9 ml of distilled water and make it 10 ml. And now this solution becomes as 1 in 10,000. And the dose is 0.1 to 0.3 ml per kg of this 1 in 10,000 epinephrine. And that should be preferably given intravenously either through an umbilical route or through a peripheral venous route if you can have that. But if you do not have a venous route available, then you can give it intratracheally. For that you need to do an intubation and you can give 10 times higher dose into the endotracheal tube, into the trachea and that also works in such a But preferred route of giving epinephrine during neonatal resuscitation is intravenously. Thank you, Dr. Saluja, for letting us know about the various methods of resuscitating the babies. Uh, to recapitulate, uh, we have talked today about uh, T, A, B, C. We talked that A, we had to make sure that the airways are clear. Air A, the step B goes over to the breathing. Suppose the child is not breathing, we are watching, assessing at every stage and then evaluating and then uh, carrying out the various interventions to make sure that the child is able to breathe. The number of breaths uh, were about to the tune of 30 breaths per minute, 40 breaths per, per minute in a child are fine and uh, there should be free flow of air uh, into the lungs and uh, we then come to the C part of it 
that is circulation and what is circulation what is the indication that the child circulation is okay is the color of the child we all know that the normal newborns are supposed to be pink and uh, if there are the generally uh, sometimes we do find that the babies might have peripheral cyanosis that could be due to uh, hypothermia but if there is central cyanosis and uh, the child's heart rate is uh, less than 100 less than 60 per minute then we have just now seen the demonstration of how to uh, carry out the positive pressure breathing and chest compression simultaneously and keep on assessing the condition of the child for 30 seconds and then again for 30 seconds and if after about a minute or so we are not able to revive the child and then simultaneously we carry out the procedure of drug administration which has been just now explained to you by Dr. Saluja. Uh, thank you Dr. Saluja for the resuscitative steps. What, uh, uh, what are the indications for endotracheal intubation? <coughs> Why should the baby... Yeah. See endotracheal intubation can be done uh, uh, at many steps during neonatal resuscitation. The first step where you may need to do endotracheal intubation is during the initial steps if the liquor is meconium stained and the baby is not vigorous you may have to do endotracheal intubation. Those babies who require prolonged positive pressure ventilation beyond 3 to 5 minutes may need endotracheal intubation. Those babies where bag and mask post ventilation to provide positive pressure ventilation is not effective you may have to do endotracheal intubation. When we are doing positive pressure ventilation along with chest compressions sometimes this may not be very well coordinated that's the time you may have to do endotracheal intubation and give bag and tube ventilation instead of bag and mass ventilation. Then of course during the time of administering medications if you do not have an excess intravenous excess you may have to intubate the baby to give intratracheal medications. Then there are certain medical conditions like diaphragmatic hernia, extremely premature babies where you need to give surfactant just beyond resuscitation are the ones where you may have to electively intubate. Uh, would you like to review the evaluation again about how to evaluate the baby and decide upon the various steps? Okay. Now, the first uh, slide which you had shown, the action evaluation and decision making. You see, when we talk about uh, the resuscitation, we talk about three things. First is evaluation. How do we evaluate? Evaluate by asking those four questions. Whether this baby is a healthy baby, or this baby is at risk baby. Healthy baby is the one who is born at term, through a clear liker, cries at birth, had a good muscle tone, goes for routine care. But those babies who are at risk, who are either born premature, or have meconium stained amniotic fluid, or do not cry at birth, or are, have poor muscle tone, would go through initial steps. And what do we do in initial steps? We take care of T and A part of resuscitation. We put, place them under the warmer. By doing this, we are providing them warmth. We clear their airway by positioning the baby's head in slight extension of the neck. We clear the airway by do suctioning of the mouth first and then the nose. If it is meconium stained amniotic fluid and if it is a vigorous baby, we continue the resuscitation in the same way. If it is a non-vigorous baby, we perform endotracheal suctioning. After we have done the suctioning, we do drying of the baby. We dry all aspects of all parts of the body and then throw away the wet linen, rewrap the baby in dry linen and then reposition the baby in slight extension of the neck. Next step is to make an assessment to see if the baby is breathing or not. If the baby is breathing, then we check the heart rate to see if the heart rate is more than 100 or not. Then check the color. If the color is pink, then this baby goes for observational care. But if the baby is not breathing, we provide couple of tactile stimulations and then reassess again. If still the baby doesn't breathe, we proceed to positive pressure ventilation.
Okay, Dr. Saluja, thank you very much for your good session and uh, demonstration. I think students must have been fitted with uh, this demonstration. The, with, the, with this, I would uh, again, once again, thank Mrs. Kothuria and Dr. Saluja for the nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.